Welcome to the Lifestyle First podcast, discussing lifestyle medicine and making self-care as easy as one, two, three. One question, two research reviews, and three actionable health tips, all centered around the Lifestyle First method, your blueprint for the 10 key roots of optimal health and happiness. And now your host, lifestyle medicine physician and coach, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello. Welcome everybody to series seven. And the theme in the lifestyle first method that we're focusing on today is one of my favorite. It's L for learning habits. And the one question that we're answering today is what tiny habits result in a healthy heart? And to explore that question, I would like to welcome to the conversation, Dr. Robert Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a cardiologist in Ireland. He's an assistant professor of clinical medicine and also an honorary senior lecturer. And he's a certified lifestyle medicine physician like myself, and also a certified tiny habits coach, having been trained by the author of that fabulous book, Tiny Habits, Mr. BJ Fox. And he says what he likes to do is to design small steps for big breakthroughs. So Robert, welcome. It really is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. Yeah, very, very welcome. So where shall we start this conversation? Now, we talk about teachable moments in medicine, don't we, Robert? It's those moments in your life when you're at your most receptive to change. And I think that as doctors, we really do try and take advantage of that moment in our patients, don't we, to, I think, really encourage them to change their habits, change their actions, change their behaviors for ultimately better, better health. And of course, you'll know this, but one of those teachable moments is after a heart attack. Now, the stat I've come across is that one person every five minutes has a heart attack in the UK. So that is an awful lot of teachable moments. You know, it's that time, isn't it, when the fragility of life is there upon you, the meaning of life, thinking about that. And there's that opportunity for that second chance so I really wondered, um, Robert, as a cardiologist, of course, you'll have seen so many patients through their heart attacks. But over the years, what I've seen as a GP is that that initial need or commitment that patients have to make changes for their future, somehow it just seems to ebb away within months or weeks and even days sometimes after that initial heart attack, that initial teachable moment. So I wanted to ask you, why do you think that is, why is it that sustainable change is so hard, even after something so life-changing as a heart attack? What do you think? So I think that's a great question. Um, certainly in cardiology, um, the great joy of being a cardiologist is you do deal with people who are acutely unwell. And, you know, in a heart attack, you may die. So you obviously have the capacity to save somebody's life. Um, I think a lot of people at that time are very shocked by what's happened and are not necessarily uh, good for remembering things. So I don't think patients per se, uh, they know that they shouldn't smoke cigarettes. They know that they should do things about their weight. They know that maybe there's certain food they're eating that they shouldn't be eating. Um, and they know that that's contributed or perhaps they're in a very stressful job in life and that's what's doing it. Um, but most of them know that. Um, and one of the challenges with the health system, both for doctors, GPs, and other points of uh, meeting patients, is that we give a lot of information to patients. We get great satisfaction as doctors telling patients everything about heart conditions, as an example. And unfortunately, patients take that information away, and most of them throw the information in the bin, never to read it again. Um, and then some of the systems are not exactly set up to follow up on patients and give them information. Cardiac rehabilitation after a heart attack is a great uh, facility because patients get to interact with people who will provide more information. Unfortunately, that's not the way to get people to change their behavior. The other comment that you make about a heart attack and that being life-threatening is you would expect most people's motivation at that time to respond to a teachable method so that you would expect where your life is on the line that surely that's the time that you realize that it's time to stop smoking or surely you realize that maybe it's the time to make other changes in your lifestyle but unfortunately as you know and i know that doesn't happen 
One of the interesting cardiology studies is a study out of Europe called the Euro Aspire trial, which includes all the countries in Europe. It includes the UK as well. And the data for that in Ireland shows that two years after a heart attack, 50% of heart attack survivors are still overweight. They do not do anything about their eating habits. The obesity level is the same. The diabetes level is the same. The blood pressure level is the same. So we're clearly failing as a cardiology community in terms of optimizing the health and, and, and the management of patients to prevent them having future heart attacks. Mm. I am um, resonating with what you say, and in particular, when you use that word overwhelm, because mm. these times in our lives can feel incredibly overwhelming. And at that state, in that state of overwhelm, we just don't have the capacity for really focusing on what is important, despite the sort of logic brain telling us um, there's so much emotion, isn't there, um, at these times in our lives as well. Um, so I just want to maybe go to the opposite of overwhelm and to that word tiny um, and tiny habits. I mean, that's you know what you've been, been studying as a tiny habits coach. Um, I know in the opening of BJ Fogg's book, he says tiny is mighty, doesn't he? He says, I think he says tiny is fast, tiny can start now, tiny is safe and tiny can grow big. So how do we change that overwhelm, which feels big to start with into something that's so tiny that we can actually make those exact changes that you've been referring to and let them grow big. So the tiny habits method for anybody out there who hasn't read it, go and read BJ Fogg's book because it is inspiring in terms of how you can change your behavior. I came across BJ Fogg because I found that dealing with patients, I would sit with a patient who I would suggest needed to lose weight as an example or change their eating habits. And then 12 months later, I would sit with the same patient and discover they couldn't fit into the chair in front of me. And I would recognize that nothing had happened within the 12 months. And I would try and motivate the patient around all the heart risks and say, this is what you should be doing and become very despondent at my end to realize that nothing was really impacting the patient. Even taking tablets was not changing the reason why patients were getting the heart problems in the first place. But what I did find was I needed to find a way, a method that I could help patients make changes in their behavior. And I was introduced to Tiny Habits in an article I actually read on a holiday in the New York Times where BJ Fogg had just released his book and he was interviewed about what Tiny Habits was all about. And as you say, the principle of Tiny Habits is that you design ways to make very, very small adjustments in the behaviors that contribute to what you do in life. And then as a consequence of using this particular method, what you achieve are new habits. So if you want to become healthier, or if you want to reduce your risk of a heart problem, well, certain things are very good behaviors to take up. So going for a walk, eating five portions of vegetables or two portions of fruit, uh, drinking more water as examples, they're all very good little habits that you can learn how to do as a, by applying the BJ Fogg tiny habit method. For sure. And there's research, wasn't there, by, um, I think it's Frank Huss and his team, they looked at data from the nurses' health study and data from the health professionals' follow-up study. And it's exactly what you said. They found that there were five healthy lifestyle factors, which if people followed, they would gain a decade more in their longevity, that's 10 years of life by following five, I say very simple, lifestyle factors. And these five were around, as you said, eating healthier, so vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grains, omega-3s, um, exercising three and a half hours a week is the number that came up in this study, moderating alcohol, keeping your BMI down, keeping your um, weight down and not smoking. So Robert, if you took just one of these, lifestyle factors. In your practice, how would you change this into tiny habits that you could build on? What sort of advice are you giving? Pick, pick one of those, because we know that these are really critical in terms of heart health and longevity. So I'll take the healthy eating one because it's, it's, it's easy enough, but I'll, I'll mention some of the others because believe it or not, they all interact. They all relate to each other. So in terms of eating and in terms of heart disease, there are certain conditions that cause heart attacks that relate to food. 
So diabetes is the principal condition that affects your blood sugar and diabetes increases your risk significantly of all forms of heart disease and strokes. So the key is to try and minimize or avoid the intake of sugar. And so what you want to do is to have a diet that is not so high in sugar intake, that is balanced in terms of carbohydrate and preferably a higher protein diet and one that has more fat in it. Those diets lead to better cardiovascular health, but more importantly, what they do is if you follow a diet that reduces calorie intake for a period of about three months, you can actually reverse the diabetes you have in the first place. That's based on a study called the DIRECT trial, which was actually undertaken in the UK. So the tiny habit approach to that with a patient is to try and change the patient's eating habits. And so there are principal eating habits that relate to this. So I try very much with my patients to get them to eat smaller amounts of food. So one of the ways to do that is to get patients to take out different plates or to take the food away from their uh, environment. So uh, you can make a one-off behavior to change a habit as an example. And BJ quotes this in a book, uh, in a story called Super Fridge, where you empty your fridge of everything that's sugary and you fill your fridge with vegetables, with a certain amount of fruit, you prepare your food in plastic containers so you have the food there to go to, particularly in the evening when your snacking tends to come in and that's where you tend to get into trouble. The other thing I try to help patients with in habits is to try to get patients to fast after their evening meal. Now, fasting may seem very radical to different people. It's not as what people might think it is. The real trick behind fasting is that after your dinner, now here's a good example of a habit. So after your dinner, ideally at about seven o'clock in the evening, you stop eating. You can have a glass of water, but you stop eating. And the reason behind that is you won't snack after your dinner. So come 10 o'clock, if you're still eating, you genuinely tend to go for sugary sweet things, or you may have a few alcoholic drinks. So the point about that is that if you fast until the next day and you don't eat again till say eight o'clock or nine o'clock, so you've done 12 hours, 13 hours, and you're asleep for most of that time, that particular action is also extremely beneficial for your health because that reduces your risk of putting on weight, but it also hugely impacts the management of risk factors for heart disease and the causes of heart disease. And so those particular measures, be it fasting, be it understanding what you're eating, be it reducing your portion size, or, and also that you eat the right food. Say we mentioned fruit and vegetables, we mentioned nuts, we mentioned water, all those things are ways that you can improve that health by improving your eating. And the simple habit methods I'll explain in a moment, uh, which is largely about uh, you know, following through those behaviors and turning those behaviors into habits. Yeah, yeah. again, that's, uh, that's so interesting because what you're again describing is in the beginning, making all these changes does need an element of very conscious processing, very intentional activity, emptying your fridge, um, et cetera. And it does need willpower. When you start off with change, with behavior change, it does need that willpower. And the trick is to continue, isn't it? It's that repetitiveness of doing the same thing again and again and again, always opening the fridge and seeing the things that you want to eat that actually changes behavioral change into, into a habit. Um, and it's again, interesting that you mentioned sugar. I must give my own um, example here because it's making me, um, making me smile and really sort of um, cementing what, what you're saying. But um, I also decided I wanted to uh, reduce my sugar intake uh, very recently actually. Um, and the one place that I have sugar, I'm going to admit this is in my tea. Um, and I've always tried to cut down and just never managed to. So I decided I was going to go cold turkey. And the only way I could do this was actually not by reducing the sugar in my tea, but by not having tea at all. And so I changed my environment. The tea, uh, the tea bags went to the back of the cupboard. The sugar went to the back of the cupboard. It wasn't in, in my vision. And I changed my habits in my mind. I was saying, normally when I come downstairs, I'll make myself a cup of tea, but this time, when I come down the stairs, I will have a glass of water. And you know what, Robert? It hasn't taken very long to that just to have become impregnated. There is no more willpower needed. I'm not even thinking about tea. Um, and uh, it's incredibly transformative. And the way to get through it 
is that repetitiveness and also that hook when I come down the stairs I'll have a glass of water when I come down the stairs I'll have a glass of water and it's magic actually it's been incredibly um, liberating and I've seen the difference and that's the other key thing isn't it with habits is recognizing the difference this makes to you because you want to do things because there's an impact and there's there's an effect so um, so those things that you use as well in your practice those oh, things so, so, so let me just explain for your audience just what you just said mm. so coming down the stairs is something that you do every day yeah. And so in BJ's book, that's called an anchor or a trigger, as some people call it, or a prompt. And so you do these things every day. So when you come down the stairs, so BJ would put it after I come down the stairs, and the behavior that you talk about is I will drink a glass of water. The bit that you don't uh, necessarily know, although the feeling of success you mentioned too, is that the tiny habits method requires that you celebrate having completed that behavior. Now, celebrations are what everybody wants to make up. You can smile, you can dance, you can sing, you can pump a fist, you can press on your heart, whatever you like. Pick one celebration that you like. And every time you complete a behavior in that way, you have to celebrate because the key to delivering these effective new habits is that you celebrate because you are emotionally attached to the behavior. You want this, it makes you feel better. You feel great in the achievement. That's the motivation. The other aspect of the motivation is it makes you feel successful. You've done something to improve your health because you've cut out sugar and you've opted to replace it by something like glasses of water. So you've also added the benefit by taking on, by removing an unhealthy habit and replacing it with a much healthier habit. And so the other comment I would make is that BJ Fogg has a thing called the Fogg Behavior Model. So the fog behavior model relates to how motivated you are to do something versus how easy it is to do it. So if you are very motivated, but the task to do or the behavior to do is very difficult, you'll get very frustrated over a period of time that you're not able to sustain it. So the typical example of that is the 1st of January, every single year, everybody decides I'm going to give up something as my New Year's resolution, or I'm going to join the gym. By the 30th of January, the vast majority of people in the gym have left the gym and the vast majority of smokers are back smoking again. So the motivation piece alone is not enough to sustain behavior change. So what BJ has discovered is that if you look at the ability to do these things, well, then if you change it, make it easier to do, then you reach a point where you don't need a lot of motivation because the task becomes so easy that you're able to do it. But you do need the prompt like coming down the stairs to get you to the point that you will actually do it because you can't remember to do all these behaviors without some form of anchoring. So anchoring the behavior, as Alka has said, coming down the stairs, do the behavior, drinking the glass of water, celebrating. She puts a big smile on her face, so uh, I, I know she's celebrating. And then most importantly, just remember, it's not all about the motivation. You can learn the method. If you learn the method, you can do this. You just have to follow the prompt. And if you run into difficulty, keep practicing celebrating. Because believe it or not, if you feel good, most of the time, you will be able to do those things that you find difficult to do. So it's the emotion that you get into your mind will help you do all the things that you should be doing. Mm, love that that's the power of our dopamine isn't it uh, Robert um, but again something else you've highlighted is motivation you do have to have a compelling why don't you, you have to have a reason for doing what it is that you want to do and that I think really comes down to to your values your identity the person that you are i think it's really important to wrap your actions around exactly that those affirmations around i am energetic or i am compassionate or i am healthy are also really really affirming aren't they because they are, they stand for who you are or indeed who who you want to be um, and sometimes they can be the motivator can't they to keep their habit perpetual so the other comment about BJ's particular method is that at the outset, you do have to visualize what you want to achieve in life. Now, I have a particular interest in vision boards as a way to do that, because I think you can put a lot of things on vision boards about wanting to be wealthy, wanting to be successful. But the important thing is also to put health as a key 
vision in terms of what you want in life. I mean, your health defines everything. Your health is your wealth. You, you won't live if you're unhealthy. You'll end up as that heart attack person we spoke about. But the real key in all of that is that you've got to define that to know exactly what that means to you. You've got to understand what health means to you. Health can mean so many different things to so many different people. And the important thing then with BJ's method is to understand, well, what sort of behaviors in your life relate to your health? So you may be an athlete. You may be an excellent sleeper. You may be the perfect body weight. Um, and you might say, well, you know, what's my health like? And I say, well, what's your stress level like? Because most of the stress, I'm afraid, and COVID's a great example of that, is actually the origin of where a lot of the problem comes from. I know that because I've been there myself. And I know that because I've changed a lot of my lifestyle only to find that it didn't solve the problem that I needed to go deeper and find out that there were some issues around self. And the big thing around stress, I would emphasize as it's mentioned in terms of clarity and understanding a, a little bit deeper of your purpose and your vision in life is also to be very self-aware because you may not realize exactly what you do or you may not realize how you're doing it and how that's contributing to why you're unhealthy. So. I firmly believe that the value of coaching uh, in this way is, is critical. I, I, I have not come across any other avenue in healthcare that actually helps people to change. But there are methods like the tiny habits that are fantastic in doing that. But you need the coach to be able to facilitate it for you. I would make just one other comment, and that is that I do believe that. So, so just a comment around BJ is that the behavior portion of where you think of the behaviors actually is very aligned to what you visualize and what you want in your life. So that the healthy one is easy enough. If you want to be less stressed out, there are ways that you can identify behaviors that might make you stressful. So you might get stressed out because you go to bed late. You might get stressed out because you drink too much alcohol. You might get stressed out because you are um, stressed out because you're working too hard. And so you can look at behaviors that may relate to each of those uh, pillars, but you can also ask your friends where they think you get stressed out as an example. So your friends might say, well, you know, you're a real pain in the neck when uh, first thing in the morning and you can work out maybe you're not sleeping so well. And then you can work out that maybe you need a new behavior that is I will go to bed at uh, 10 o'clock at night. One of the behaviors I absolutely adore from BJ is the idea of doing gratitude when you go to bed at night. And so when you lie down on the pillow, so here, here's another example of, of a habit. So after you lie down on the pillow, um, think of two things of your day that you are grateful for. Now, you have to engage within the gratitude of actually being grateful for something. You can't kind of say, I'm grateful for this, off I go to sleep. You really have to get into the emotion of it and almost experience how, why you're so grateful about it. And then you have to complete that with some form of celebration. You can drift off to sleep after that. But the point to that is you should be doing that every single night. It's powerful. You know, people who are more positive, who are more grateful, actually have a much lower risk of having a heart attack and a much lower risk of getting sick in life. So, uh, you know, all these habits actually have huge health benefits. And now here is your lifestyle first prescription. Your three activating actions to take you from knowing to doing. Let's try and leave listeners with three very focused actions. I know you've given us so much already, but in terms of habits for a healthy heart, what are three things that listeners can take away with them today? So the most important thing is to prioritize your health. Um, and you all know the pillars uh, of lifestyle. Um, and so it's important to pick one of them. You can't pick them all to start off with. So you need to start small, start tiny. You need to understand that if you do that and you practice and you follow the methods of tiny habits that we discussed, you will increase your behavior improvement over a period of time. It will take time, but it will be worth it because you have a method that the behavior will last. Your habit will sustain itself. It won't disappear at the end of January. Um, and so in trying to get that method right, you want to work out what you want in life or what your aspiration is. You want to identify behaviors related to your health, like the healthy eating example I gave you. And most importantly, as you apply that using a prompt, you want to celebrate. You want to put a smile on your face. Life is about having fun. It's about being happy. 
one of the comments I make about uh, the tiny habit method, just to, to close, is I find it powerful to find prompts of your own during the day. So you go to work or you get out of bed or you're in the car, just where you have that moment. I'm sitting in the, I'm just about to get out of the car and I'm going to smell the fresh air as my behavior and I'm going to celebrate. So you try and put aspects of happiness and joy into your day at every moment you can, because that is ultimately what life is about. What a lovely positive note to end on, Robert. Thank you so much. I'm sure people will want to find out a lot more about your methods and how you're practicing and uh, find out more about what you do. So what's the best way to, to find you and reach out? So, so I, I've left my, so, so those of you who are on LinkedIn, I have a very active uh, presence on LinkedIn. I also have a, a website, which I've, I've left, uh, which is um, robert.kellymikehijabi.com, where I run a, a number of different group programs I also post a lot of habits on a daily basis uh, to, to motivate people. Um, and of course, I have a cardiology practice website, which is rkcardiology.ie, uh, which relates a lot bit to my cardiology practice. But most of those sites interact with each other and, and people can find me. For those of you who listen in from Ireland, I work in the Beacon Hospital in Dublin uh, as a cardiologist. And I love talking to people. I love seeing people and I love lifestyle medicine. I really do. It's made a huge impact on my life and my patients absolutely love it. And, and my colleagues in work are, are gradually getting on board as well. So uh, I really look forward to hearing from any of you and communicating with any of you. And if anybody's interested in learning more, please do get in touch. Well, I'm sure people will, will, but I will be sure to put all of those links on the uh, episode descriptions and for you as well. And and absolutely uh, love your work, love what you're doing, championing lifestyle changes and lifestyle medicine um, and really having a positive impact on health. Thank you so much, Robert. It's been lovely to have you here, which simply leaves me to wish everyone a happy, healthy day. Thanks for joining us on the Lifestyle First podcast making self-care as easy as one, two, three. Don't forget to subscribe and share, and we'd love it if you'd be kind enough to leave a review. To learn more or to arrange a consultation, please visit www.dralkapatel.com. See you next time.